Good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming. My name is Don Allen, and I'll just say a few words to sort of set the stage. As you know, the, uh, the Carlisle Selectman have authorized bow hunting of deer on town land, and it's our understanding that the concern is that they have is damage to forest understory caused by perhaps a too large deer population, and that they believe that bow hunting on town land will make a worthwhile contribution to controlling that problem. Both the premise and the, the solution um, uh, involve complex, complex issues that require very careful study and analysis to get to a full and correct understanding of them. Um, an example is the, uh, uh, the issue of Lyme disease and, and, and the relationship uh, to the deer population. Um, uh, the deer, the, the uh, Center for uh, Disease Control and others have um, debunked that correlation. And it seems obvious at first, but it's an example of um, the fact that there's frequently a lot more to the, uh, to the natural world than meets the eye. So the, the, the purpose of, of, of holding this, this talk is gaining knowledge um, in, in the face of these complex issues. Um, we're not, um, our purpose is not to cast dispersions on any, on anyone, it's just simply to learn more, um, about these issues. Um, and that led to our invitation to, uh, Dr. Ruffer, Dr. Alan Ruffer. Dr. Ruffer is the director of the Center for Animals and Public Policy, which I'll refer to as CAP. Um, and a research associate professor in the Department of Biomedical Sciences at the Cummings School of Veterinary Medicine at Tufts University. He's trained as a behavioral ecologist. Dr. Ruckford Ruck earned his PhD in zoology at the University of Washington, Seattle in 1984. After completing his doctorate, Dr. Ruckford spent seven years teaching undergraduate biology at Vassar College and elsewhere. He then joined the Humane Society of the United States as Senior Scientist for Wildlife and Habitat Protection, where he served from 1991 to 2000. While at HSUS, he acted as a public advocate for the protection of wild horses, endangered species, and urban wildlife, especially white-tailed deer. At HSUS, he also initiated field studies of immunocontraceptive vaccines for the non-lethal control of deer and wild horse populations which he has continued, uh, and, um, work that he has continued since joining the Cummings School faculty in 2000. He's the author or co-author of two dozen papers and book chapters on the use of immunocontraception in deer and wild horse populations, and edited the 2005 book, Humane Wildlife Solutions, The Role of Immunocontraception, published by HSUS Press. As director of CAP's Master of Science, Pro uh, a Master of Science degree program in animals and public policy, Dr. Ruckford nurtures and guides student research projects related to human-wildlife relationships. Student projects have broadened into research collaborations focusing on how wild horses removed from the range successfully transition from their wild state, and how perceptions of deer and deer management are affected by exposure to or participation in deer immunocontraception projects. Dr. Ruckford. All right. Thank you, Don. I've been properly introduced. Um, I am not a hunter. I don't have visceral feelings about hunting. Um, some of the things that we do um, in the context of doing some of our deer projects have a lot of hunting elements to them. Um, I can see why people enjoy them. I enjoy them. Um, and I'm not here to tell the town of Carlisle, whether it should have a deer hunt or not. Um, that's none of my business. And um, um, if I had an opinion, I'd probably keep it to myself. So um, as, um, as Don said, I, um, I spent 10 years working for HSUS. And part of my job was going to town meetings like this. Um, and so at one point, I think I calculated I'd been to 50 or 60 in 20 different states. Um, and um, 
I started wondering what would bring people out on a Thursday night um, <laughs> to talk about deer, which usually is not the most pressing problem that a community will have. Um, but it's clear that people are very passionate about deer. Um, and deer seem, to, um, deer seem to embody how people feel about nature and about human relationships to nature. And people have different views on that. Um, and so a lot of the time, these different views will lead to very different policy conclusions. Um, and, and people do seem to care a lot about, about nature and, and how we fit in. So, um, so deer seem to be a surrogate for that, for that issue. Um, in any case, again, just for the, for the record, oh, that didn't work. How about this? Um, there we go. Um, so Don mentioned the Tufts Center for Animals and Public Policy. Um, started in 1983, I believe, uh, by my distant predecessor, Andrew Rowan, uh, and some of his colleagues. Um, and as part of the vet school, it's nice to be surrounded by a community of people who care about animals, but people care about animals in really different ways. And we're interested in understanding the different ways that people care about animals. Um, and we work with the assumption that, that animal well-being matters that human and animal welfare are linked, though not necessarily always positively, um, but that, that both the welfare of animals and the welfare of people are linked through, their, um, through a better understanding of, of their relationships and, and the origins of, and nature of those relationships. So anyway, that's my plug for the center. Um, I've been there since I got there. So context, um, talking about gear. So this I just got off the Mass Wildlife webpage. This is from their 2018 report on, on deer harvests. And they're kind of excited because 2018 was a great year for harvesting deer. Um, but if you stand back a little bit farther and you look at that chart, you say to yourself, well, deer populations in Massachusetts have been going up since 1965, pretty steadily. And you know, there are some good years and some bad years. You know, there was 2015. I'll bet that's 2015 over there, um, when when deer numbers really sort of took a hit. But overall, they've been they've been increasing in the state, um, and most of that increase is in the eastern part of the state. And I'm sure that Mr. Stainbrook talked about that as well. Um, so. More than half of the deer harvest in the state um, comes from the part of the state that is east of Worcester. Um, and uh, well over half of the archery um, harvest comes from zones 10 and 11, basically, the strip that's east of Worcester. We'll look at those for in a minute. So anyway, population's been rising steadily. There's been hunting that whole time. Right. Nobody has, has, has discouraged hunters from hunting in that, in that time. So that's the, the, the big context. Um, so deer population management is really hard in suburbs. And you're here in part for that because of that, that fact. And of course, there are other kinds of challenges as well, including some of the, the different feelings that people have about deer that, that really complicate it. And, and sort of uh, build conflict in communities. But um, I'm going to stay away from that tonight, though it's one of my favorite topics. And I'm going to stick more or less to, to deer and deer behavior and, and how they do in suburbs and what to do about it. So um, deer ecology. Deer do great in suburbs. It is not a question of the deer being here and us invading their habitat. We created this habitat, and they love it, and they've moved in in big numbers. So as I was saying, this area here, throw in, throw in zone nine here out to Worcester, now accounts for more than half the deer harvest in the state of Massachusetts. I don't have any reason to believe that there are more hunters there. It'd be an interesting thing to know. I don't know. Um, we create habitats for deer in suburbs that are perfect for them. Right, they are edge species. Everybody tells you that deer are edge species, which means they like lots of blocks of different stuff because there's more vegetation that they can reach. Right, 
old forests, mature and maturing forests, where all the food is 50 feet over their heads, is not a great place to be for deer. So deer, de deer density seem to be pretty low in mature forests for the most part. Um, but what they like is they like small woodlots where they can, you know, they can snuggle in when they're, when they're not eating and to avoid bad weather, and fields and parks and backyards, especially if they're big backyards that are planted with really yummy stuff that's watered and fertilized. So, um, so that's good stuff for them. And so they exist at much higher numbers in this part of the state than the other part of the state. Um, you know, big lots of forests out there, not good deer habitat for the most part. Um, and also some more severe weather out there, which doesn't, doesn't help them either. Um, the woodlots in suburban areas are full of deer that are not being supported by the woodlots. It's the density of deer that are essentially uh, set by the surrounding food sources. And then they go into these little 20, 50, 100 acre woodlots and they're, they're going to eat while they're there. Um, but not much light coming down, not much productivity. Um, even small numbers of deer will have a significant effect on, on the woodlot um, vegetation at you know, anything below this level. And so I spent a number of years in Maryland and going to places in New Jersey and New York and, and Pennsylvania that have way more deer than we did. Um, and so we are fortunate enough to live someplace where there aren't many forests where you can see through them from about this level down because the deer have eaten absolutely everything in reach. So we're not, we're not at that point. And when Mass Wildlife says um, that 20 to 30 deer per square mile are too much, um, there are deer biologists down in Maryland who would give limbs for deer densities that low. Um, but we're, we're in a different habitat, we're in a different environment, and so different numbers are suitable for different places. Um, okay, so anyway, part of the problem is that deer really do extremely well in the areas that we, we've created for them. They survive well, and they reproduce fast. Um, so if they're not taken by hunters, they will have an 80 to 90%, adults will have an 80 to 90% chance of surviving to the next year. Most does will produce two fawns each year, um, and, and they'll do well for themselves. Another complication. Um, the core of deer social organization, the reproductive units of deer, are small groups of related females who don't move from where they were born. This is a suburban phenomenon. There have been half a dozen or more studies that have shown that. Um, every place we've worked in terms of our, our deer studies, um, we find that the deer are always, that, that most female deer will be next year where we saw them this year. And so there are certain numbers that will leave. Um, number 10 from our our last New York study, our, our, Hastings, our Hastings on Hudson study, <clears throat> which was tagged in 2015, showed up, uh, was taken by a hunter at a, um, a um, reserve 13 miles away on the other side of Interstate 287. I don't know how he did, she did that, but a few of them will disappear. Um, we just, for our, our new study in Head of the Harbor on Long Island, um, one of our deer that we tagged in March or April was taken by a hunter eight miles away. But that's kind of unusual. Um, so most of them stay put. And so uh, the males do different things. When they're about a year old, they go off by themselves and they may travel for long distances. They have fairly large home ranges. They're looking for females in the fall. They move around a lot more. But they don't affect reproduction. The reproduction and the important part of deer population biology is these females. Um, and so 70 to 80% of adult females, maybe more, 
um, spend their whole lives within maybe half a mile or a quarter mile of where they were born, they don't move. Um, and it might be a little bit different out here. Um, you know, in denser, uh, denser suburbs with more food, their home ranges might be smaller, they may be a little larger out here, but, um, but in general, they're quite stable in their movement. Deer population control is about controlling female populations. Males are irrelevant. They wander around, they do stuff. But if you want to control population growth, population growth is determined by the number of fawns that each female produces each year and how well those fawns survive. So what that means is all suburban deer management is local. So what you do in the conservation land across the street here is going to have no effect on your conservation land a mile or two miles away. Those deer never see each other. Um, you might have a stray that goes off, but, but in general, it's extremely localized. A corollary, a corollary to this that was, um, was shown in an experiment, and which we've certainly seen as well, um, is that if you remove some deer, remove some females from an area, it's a pretty long time before anybody else fills in. Um, again, as I say, there are there's a few satellites who go out there looking for stuff, but females mostly stay put. If you remove them, um, your effect will be local. And you don't have females sloshing around and is, you know, like gas molecules. They're, they're, they're animals, right? They're creatures of habit. They like where they are. They know it's where the safe places are. They know where the hazards are. They know where the food is at different times of year. They're normal animals and they stay put. So that's the second part of it. What you do over in this corner of town will have no effect with what, um, what happens in the other corner of town. Um, the last, the other thing that's made it hard in terms of logistics and ecology and population biology is hunting is pretty limited in suburbs, right? So it happens to be true that um, since 1965, which was the beginning of that graph, the number of hunters in, Mass in New England has dropped by about 50%. The absolute numbers, I'm not talking about population, about percentages, the absolute number is half of what it was in 1965, which means fewer hunters to go around. Um, then, of course, suburbs produce all this land that's not huntable. And so these deer are on schoolyards, and they're on golf courses, and they're in parks, and they're in people's backyards, and all kinds of places where it's just not safe to, to destroy your weapon. So they have all these safe places they can go, and they know where the safe places are. They're not stupid. Um, so the amount of huntable land has declined significantly. Um, and of course, if you're in a heavily settled area, even if you are, um, you know, if you're in a woodlot or a conservation area that's 50 or 100 or 200 acres, um, there are limits, as, as you know. Um, Massachusetts, again, has this 500 foot no discharge zone, which is pretty generous, but that really means you can't hunt in those areas. And then, and I've read your, read your regulations and your conditions for, for hunters, you can only hunt from tree stands, you can only hunt from tree stands a certain distance from hiking trails, you can only point your tree stands in one direction. Every time you impose a condition like that, it makes it harder for hunters, right? It makes them less efficient. And of course, there's this piece of it, um, which is that you have to use archery, right? Because guns are just not safe in suburban areas, for the most part. Um, they're broadly public, publicly unacceptable, but you, know, you can't be firing a gun in a woodlot that's only half a mile wide, because um, that bullet can leave that woodlot. So, so mostly this is archery hunting, which itself is a huge hunt handicap to reducing deer. Um, Mass Wildlife likes to talk about the quabbin and the great job that, that hunters did in reducing deer populations in the quabbin. They were using firearms, right? Because you can do that in the quabbin. There's nobody around. Um, but you can't do that in suburbs. So you're stuck with, uh, with archery hunters. And here's the problem with archery hunters. 
hunt, hunting and hunt, not hunters, but hunting. Um, this is from a paper in the Wildlife Society Bulletin from uh, 2013. Sorry, that's a little bit small. Um, this is the estimated density of deer, and this is years of hunting. And this is four different hunting exercises. Again, this is New Jersey, and I think it's all New Jersey, um, maybe some Pennsylvania. So the deer densities are whacked to begin with. But so here we have a, a deer density of 80 per kilometer square. So that's, you multiply that by two and a half. And so that's about 200 deer per square mile, really. Um, and I think they did a sharpshoot there. They just brought people in and blasted the heck out of the deer. But what you notice then is they get it down to about 40 deer per square mile, and they can't get it down any farther. Again, that won't necessarily be the number here because that's much, that seems to be better habitat for deer down there. But the point is, you reach a level at which hunting doesn't drive numbers down anymore. And there are lots of reasons for that. Um, hunting itself becomes more inefficient. Hunters go someplace else where they're more likely to see deer. Um, there are lots of reasons for that. But at all four of those sites, they hit about 40, mile, 40 deer per square mile, and that was it. Um, and so this goes out to, in one case, 11 years with no, no decline in deer populations after the initial drop. Um, this is a cool study that was done by Mark Weckel, who is a colleague. I've collaborated with him a little bit. Um, he's now at the American Museum of Natural History, but this was part of his PhD work. Um, so what he did is he interviewed bow hunters um, in Westchester County, New York, which has a lot of deer, which is one of the reasons we work there. Um, and asked them how many times, how much time they spent in the woods and did calculations about deer density versus the amount of time it takes to get a deer. This again is archery hunters for this line. These are gun hunters. And as you see with the, the, the firearms hunting, they're pretty efficient for a long way. And it's not till you get down to really low densities of deer that they stop being efficient. Um, this, is, this number here is 20 hours per deer taken. OK. But archery hunters are more inefficient from the beginning. And once you get to a certain level, which in this case um, is probably about 20 or 25 deer per square mile. Again, it's Westchester. It may be different. Um, it becomes so inefficient that it's not worth doing it anymore. Right. So, Folks over here at what they describe as 10 deer per kilometer square, which is about 25 deer per square mile, they're spending 80 hours per deer taken. You're not going to control a prolific deer population with that level of inefficiency unless you've got bow hunters every 20 yards, which you can't have because it's not safe. So the point here is that whatever the exact numbers are, the efficiency of archery hunting declines really fast at once it gets past a certain threshold. And the point of this paper is that once you get down to about 15 deer per square mile, you can never get deer numbers lower with archery hunting. Again, the numbers may be different here, but the principle is going to hold. So we have this problem with archery hunting. Um, I took this out of your website. It was very nice that you guys compiled these, these numbers. Um, I went to the town websites to see if there were any updates, and there weren't. Um, so just looking at the number of deer harvested um, for the few towns that actually had numbers, um, Dover sort of stabilized at 29 in 2012. And in 2017, it was 28, um, which is pretty similar to 29. Birmingham got three in their first year, and they haven't published any data since then. Um, Weston got 18 in 2012, and you guys got 10 last year. Um, those are really small numbers. Think about how many deer you actually have in Carlisle, and think about the impact that taking 10 deer out of the population would have. And think about that in the context of a highly, of a well-fed and prolific bunch of females who are out there. So if you were you know, looking at 100 deer on your conservation area or something like that, 
40 or 50 of them will be female, most of them will twin next spring. There will be 60 or 70 or 80 more fawns on the ground in the spring. The 10 deer in particular, the five females, will not have any global impact on population. You won't be able to measure it. And so the efficiency also is pretty similar. Um, the numbers are days, uh, hunter days, rather than um, hours per harvest. But 1,800 days per deer harvested. And I don't know what a day represents, whether that's two hours or it's four hours or more or less. Um, but it means that, that hunters went out into the field 18 times before they got a deer, on average. OK. And obviously, some people did very well, and some people didn't get anything, which is the way it usually goes. So the point is, for all these towns, including Carlisle, um, the archery hunt is not going to make any difference in terms of solving global problems. You know, you might have a local impact in one conservation area, in a very small area. But again, you're dealing with a bunch of females who will be cranking out fawns in the spring. Um, and again, the effect will be unmeasurably small. So, conclusions, first part of the, of the, of the talk. Um, bow hunting is not going to address serious deer issues. It's not a coincidence that that statewide number keeps going up as archery number is going up. Again, we're talking about half the number of hunters we had in 1965, but harvest is way up. And what that tells you is there are a lot more deer and there are a lot more deer in the eastern part of the state. And it's not clear to me that anything that hunters are doing are controlling those numbers. They're still going up. Maybe they're going up a little bit more slowly than they would otherwise, but that's not the point. Or that's not the goal anyway. So if you're gonna do an archery hunt on your conservation land, it's a recreational hunt. If you want to do that, go ahead, do a recreational hunt. Um, again, that's not any of my business. Um, that's, that's yours. Um, but it is not accurate to tell the community that this is there to solve deer problems, because it won't. So what can you do? It's hard, as I said. And there's no, there are still no good answers. So, you know, there's the mitigation stuff. Um, and um, I notice you guys have, you have some deer crossing signs up, which is good. I was really happy I didn't hit a deer tonight. Um, and you have a really nice website on, on the ticks um, and Lyme disease and other tick-borne diseases. Um, so public education is really important. But the thing is, you need to break down the individual challenges. What are the conflicts? What are the problems you want to solve? And think about each of them. It would be nice if you could reduce the deer population dramatically, but you probably can. So, so the alternative approach is to think about how to reduce deer vehicle collisions, how to deal with biodiversity. And, um, and again, it's not just going to be deer that are, that's affecting the biodiversity in your, in your, in your woodland. There's dogs, there's people, there's invasive plants, there's all kinds of stuff going on that, that will need to be addressed even if you could address the deer populations. Um, if you're really serious and it's really important and you have very serious problems, and again, a lot of communities in the Mid-Atlantic have done this kind of thing, is you hire someone who knows what he's doing, brings his crew along, sets up, they shoots at night over bait, and you shoot a lot of deer that way. I'm not, I'm not sure whether Mass Wildlife will let you do that. But, but in places that have serious deer problems, that's how you handle it. Um, and if the person doing it is competent, you're going to reduce the deer population. It would be done humanely to the extent that the deer, um, the deer um, have a quick death, um, but that, I mean that, it is what it is, it's effect, it can be effective. A lot of stakeholders on all sides don't like it as, a, as an approach. Um, animal protectionists don't like it because it seems to involve a lot of killing deer. 
Um, it does involve a lot of killing deer. It's not sportsmanlike. It is, it is a slaughter. I mean, and it's intended to be one. It's supposed to be efficient. You're trying to kill as many animals as possible. <coughs> and so I'm here, I've heard plenty of sportsmen say that they don't like them. So, <clears throat> but if, if you really have a serious problem and you're willing to spend a bunch of money to do this and, um, and risk some community outrage, then that's the other way to go. Excuse me. So, okay. So that's end of part one. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about deer contraception, not because you should do it here, uh, nor could we could we offer it if you were interested. We are maxed out, and I don't know anybody else who could do it. And there are lots of regulatory hurdles and stuff like that. But what I want to do is sort of share my experience of what it takes to run a successful urban deer project. Um, it's because it's research, it's more elaborate than what you need to do for management. But there's a lot of good, a lot of good information, um, a lot of good lessons learned. So we've been working on deer contraception. I've been working on deer contraception since 1993, um, which is a really long time. Um, but the main reason to use it is that the, the, the existing alternatives aren't that great. Um, I figured out a long time ago that mitigation is very nice, um, but it's hard to get people to do it. And there's always a strong residual feeling that, yeah, I'll, you know, I will plant this and I'll put up some fences, but I really would be happier if there were fewer deer. So we started doing it for that reason. We have some advantages. Um, we have better access than, <coughs> than hunters do. Um, and I'll explain why in a minute. But we can, we can dark deer on the street. We do that. Um, we have taken advantage of community interest to engage the communities in the projects. So they become not just um, us coming in and solving somebody's deer problem, but the community learning about their deer and learning about deer management and, and what it takes to, to deal with, with deer in, a, in, in the context of a community. So anyway, there's some good reasons for trying it. Um, quick, uh, this is not going to be much about deer contraception. I'm going to make, I'm going to make some points here. Um, but because people were going to ask, the agent we use is something called porcine zona pellucida. Um, it was patented by Merck in like 1975. They were thinking about it as a human contraceptive. It turned out not to be as effective as um, the existing birth control technologies, so they dropped it. But it works great for a lot of different stuff. Um, it's a protein extracted from pig ovaries, from slaughterhouse pigs. Uh, yes, there's a lot of work that's been done on recombinants, and we may be getting there. But right now, it's still coming from pig ovaries. Um, vaccinating females, who are not pigs, with PZP tends, well, induces antibodies that then bind to their own zone of pellucida, which is this membrane that surrounds the egg, and prevents sperm from attaching. Simple mechanism, but it's a protein. If it's eaten, it's destroyed in digestion, like any pig protein that you would eat. Um, ongoing pregnancies are not affected by PZP treatments. The side effects are pretty minimal. It's pretty safe, and we've put it in, into a lot of animals at this point. Um, it's been used in probably 100 species of zoo animals in zoos all over the world. It's been used a lot in wild horses, which is yet another story. There are 28 game, ref game ranches in South Africa that now control their elephant populations with PZP, which is very cool, so they don't have to shoot them, uh, which makes people feel good. It's been used in deer, and we'll talk about that. It's even been used in bison. Um, works really well, maybe a little too well in bison. Um, it may be a sterilant in bison. But in any case, um, it's been very widely tested. When you start an animal, how long does it last? OK, we'll get there. So it can be delivered by hand or by dart. 
Um, the initial trials with what we call native PZP, which is registered with EPA, um, requires annual boosters. It takes two initial shots and then, then one shot a year after that, at least for a few years. And then it may last a little bit longer. And that's the first ones that we tested. There's another version that is called PZP22 for obscure reasons. Um, there's a control release vaccine. So it has control release pellets that um, simulate boosters, essentially, that release at intervals afterwards. Um, again, we can give it, we can dart animals with them, or we can inject it by hand if we have to capture them and tag them and mark, it, mark them. Okay, we've been doing this for a long time. These are five of our studies. We've done a couple of others. Um, Maryland, South Carolina. We do a lot in New York, um, in part because uh, New York DEC has been super helpful um, in terms of, of advising us on research and giving us permits, plus they have a gazillion deer in New York. And it's a real, it's a huge problem. So anyway, um, this is where we are. Um, it takes a long time to do these studies because you have to put the stuff in the animal and then you have to follow it for several years and figure out how well it works. And so all our studies last a long time and it's taken a long time to find things out. But over the 26 years since, since we started doing this, um, we know it works. Just to say, if you follow this, at least initially the two shot, one shot protocol, um, it's about 80 to 85% effective, right? So if you're dealing with deer populations where um, typically 80% of the females or more are having fawns every year, um, we can get it down to 10 or 15%. So it works pretty well. Um, we can also do it, we've also showed a long time ago that we can do it in the field. We can administer it either by hand, by capturing deer and hand injecting them, or by DART, um, and it works on free-roaming deer. Um, and that's, that's been known for a while. Um, we now have the PZB22 um, lasts for two to three years with a single shot, which is obviously for any, almost any free-ranging deer, except for Fire Island and a couple other places where they're super tame, you can't treat them every year, because you can't. They're smart. They figure out that you're carrying something. They recognize your car. They recognize your clothes. Uh, they recognize you, and they're out of sight. So, and, and I'm sure hunters generally know that. So, so you can't treat them every year, except at these places where they're super tame. Um, and we've also reduced populations using just contraception at, a, at several field sites. So I'll talk about that. So we've come a long way in, in those 25 years, and we're almost there, actually. So I'm just going to talk briefly about two of our study sites. Um, one is Fripp, this is Fripp Island in South Carolina, one of my favorites, because you know when you're not darting deer, you can watch the pelicans and the dolphins playing in the water and stuff like that. And it's really lovely. It's a re residential and retirement community uh, right on the coast, just a little ways north of um, Hilton Head. Excuse me. Um, we had a control site there. There was another island right next to it, which was separated by about a quarter mile of water. Um, and there we captured deer. We put tags in their ears. Um, there was a lot of deer at Fripp Island. I mean, again, we captured 258 deer. That's all females. That's on four square miles. That's over several years. But there were probably, I don't know, 300 deer or something when we got there on four square miles. A lot of deer um, out on the golf courses, all times of, out on the street, all times of day, um, because they were really hungry and they needed to eat all the time. So um, the other site that I'll talk about is, is still ongoing. Um, it's the one I was describing before in Hastings on Hudson in New York. Um, I'm a New Yorker. Um, this is very familiar to me. Um, it's a terrible place to work on deer. But they had probably 200 deer when we got there, again, on four square miles. And of course, a lot of this stuff is very urban. 
it's like downtown. There's the, you know, there's the um, Metro, Metro North is over there. There's, you know, that's, that's downtown. Uh, there's some open space. The biggest single open space is that Hillside Park ever over here, uh, which is about 100 acres. Um, they actually also considered doing a hunt and said, you gotta be kidding me. There's like, maybe they could get two bow hunters into Hillside Park because it's completely surrounded by houses and um, including that little thing going in. And so they realized the hunt was not gonna do anything for them. Um, so we started working there in 2014. We ear tagged 70 deer over five years and we hand treated them with this PZP22 stuff, the, the time release thing. Um, and as part of the experiment here, um, we, dart, we're, we darted them with boosters after two and a half years because we want to see how long the boosters last because we don't know. Um, this is combined data. I'm sorry, I'm showing you data from Fripp Island and Hastings on Hudson. As of last year, 80% um, of those females get pregnant every year. Um, and many of them are having twins. Some triplets occasionally. It's, you know, it's, there's lots to eat in Hastings and Hudson. Um, year one, about 10% of them have fawns. Year two, about 20% of them have fawns. So it clearly has um, an extended effectiveness with this single hand injection. The booster, which we give remotely, seems to be working too. And it looks like it's working into a third year so far but that is in progress. So we do have this vaccine, which is reasonably practical because we can put it into deer um, and it'll last two or three years. We can give them another booster. After a few years down the line, that may last another three years or maybe longer. Um, and so that may, means maybe in the lifetime of an adult deer, or adult female, we maybe need to treat her, treat her twice, maybe three times, that's it. So that's a little bit more reasonable for suburban deer. Uh, yeah, okay. We also, FRIP was also a great place to look at population effects because it really was an island. Um, over the years that we worked there, we never saw one of our tagged deer on the other side of the water. Uh, we very rarely saw deer coming in to the island. So it was a really nice experimental situation. Um, and this is the, that's the control. This is our FRIP island. So. After a few years of treating deer there, we got um, fawns down to about one per every five does across the population. We treated most of those animals, probably 80 to 90% of the females were treated there, but we did really well. And as a result, because of the, declining, um, the decline in the fawning numbers, there are animals dying. We're not sure how they die. Um, they don't have deer vehicle collisions because people drive around on golf carts and they're not killing deer with golf carts. Um, there are alligators. There was at least one sighting of a alligator dragging a tag deer under, but I don't know, we don't know what happened. But in any case, over the course of the study, over about five years, we got about a 50% decline in the numbers there. And what was cool about it, we weren't, we didn't really study it because we weren't expecting it and weren't planning for it, the deer kind of disappeared. Even though there was still plenty of deer on the island, that's for a little less than 40 deer per kilometer squared, so that's still like a lot of deer. Um, you stop seeing them in the day, and they got fat. So they would start behaving like normal deer, not out during the day, not in giant groups. You would see a few of them in the evening, the way you know good, well-behaved deer are supposed to be. So, so that was that was good. Um, of course, the criticism for for doing that work is that it's an island, right? And that doesn't really apply to most suburbs right? or most habitats because deer move and. So there's a lot of interest in showing whether we could reduce deer populations in what would be an open environment. So we started working in Hastings in 2014, as I said. Um, this is open. Okay, that's the Hudson River over there. So nothing's crossing that. 
But there's Yonkers to the south and Dobbs Ferry to the north. Um, Sawmill River Parkway is over there, and it seems like it would be a barrier, but it's not. They cross that all the time, probably at 3 o'clock in the morning, but, and they're, they're savvy about it, but, but it's not that strong a barrier. So in any case, it's up on at least two sides and sort of on three sides. It's a typical sort of Westchester suburban community. Um, I didn't worry too much about whether we could control deer populations there because of this thing about how deer behave, about how female deer behave. And they were highly consistent with what we were expecting. Um, there are five deer that we caught in 2014, all the survivors who were left, um, four of whom, maybe all of whom, but there, there's a core group of four that were still in the same place we caught them in 2014, last summer. They don't move. And so as we drive around the village, we know where to look for particular deer. Again, we had you know, deer number 10 who took off from here and ended up getting taken way north. But those deer are mostly staying put. Um, where we're having problems in terms of seeing fawns, we're seeing fawns at the edges. We're seeing fawns up here, and we're seeing fawns down here because we can't work down here, and we can't work up there. And so we get untagged does who are spending most of their time outside the village coming in and having fawns or at least we see them with their fawns in. So still, we're not seeing a lot of fawns there. Um, so they don't care whether it's Dobbs Story or it's Yonkers or it's Tasting on Hudson. So we have some preliminary on population estimates. This is super preliminary. But when we got here, the estimate was that we had about 80 does there and about 60 fawns. In 2018, we saw 12 fawns after spending four or five days, actually on two, two separate weeks, looking for them, um, and probably between 48 and 55 does. Um, obviously, the number of fawns has, um, has decreased significantly. And again, the fawns we saw were mostly along here. Um, and so it's probably working. We're still, we're still working on it. Um, but it's probably working. Um, anyway, here are some, you know, some of the lessons of, of, that we've acquired for, for deer contraception. Um, the three important things are access, accountability, and community engagement. Access is complicated. Partly it depends on the behavior of the deer. Will they stand still? Where are they going to be? Are they going to look at you and run off? Um, are they going to be places where you can dart them safely? And so with a place like Hastings, traffic is a huge issue. So we don't typically work between 5 and 6.30 because there are too many cars and it's way too scary. Um, and we can't have a deer darting out into the, into the road. Um, there are other places. It's also extremely hilly out there. Um, there are places where there are cliffs and ravines and stuff. And so we can't dart deer near there especially if we're going to capture them. So if we're going to put drugs in them, they have to be in really safe places. So they're not going to, again, stumble down a ravine or fall down a cliff or stumble into the street or any of those things. So safety is really important. Um, Got to know something about the seasonal behavior. We have to know about the movement and activity patterns. We do make generous use of trail cameras. Uh, we put up bait sites when we're trying to catch, catch deer in the winter. Um, and access to land, of course, you know. So we have a system. There's a lot of houses in Hastings. And so we have worked with the high school and with the, the village government to get permission, written permission from people to dart deer on their lots. Okay, we're talking small lots. We're talking quarter acre lots in some cases and smaller. Um, and so what we do is they sign a release and then they put a little flag up by the, their front walk. And so we know whether we have permission to dart a deer that's standing right in the front or is in the back or something, because that is that is where they go. And if we didn't have that, we wouldn't have been able to work there. Um, there's still places we were not able to get access, and um, those people 
have been paid off with fines. Um, the school was like super unreasonable. So I understand that they don't want us working there during school hours, but um, we couldn't use the school hour, schoolyard, even though it was right next to the forest, um, ever. So even if we're at 11 o'clock at night on, you know, on a Thursday and there was nobody around, we still couldn't work there. So anyway, access is really important. And to make the access work, you do need a lot of community engagement. And I'll talk about that in a minute. And the other piece of it is accountability, um, both in terms of people knowing what we're doing when we're out there. So we had a system, we had a system with the police there so that we tell them when we're gonna be out there. They know if they get weird calls from people, that there are people wandering around our neighborhood with guns, they know it's us. Or at least they can be prepared that it's, going to, it's likely to be us. Um, and uh, tangible measures of success. Right? This is, most people are pretty skeptical about deer contraception. I know this better than anybody. Um, and so if we're going to convince people to use it, we have to show them that it's working. So part of that is population counts, but it's also doing some impact studies, which are also kind of cool. Um, so with respect to community engagement, they have a web page um, in, the, in the village, which basically has all of our documentation, all of our reports to the state. They've written up their own reports. Um, we have, a, uh, we have the, the flagging system set up. We have a deer hotline that we put into effect a couple of years ago so that when we're out there, if people are seeing deer, they can call us and tell us, oh, I've got two tagged deer in my yard, come look at them. And, and, and we did have several successful, we have had several successful guardings as a result of that. But it also, you know, people who want to help have an outlet, they can call us and we can respond. Um, so that, again, is a, a community engagement kind of thing. I'll talk about Costa Hosta in a little bit. I'm very proud of that. Um, high school was doing exposure studies in, in the woodlot. Um, the police are tracking deer vehicle collisions. Um, and as I said, the village website is really good. And it's a good, it's a good thing to, to look at to get a sense of how these projects work. OK, this is the lovely, um, this is the, the synthesis of accountability and engagement. So I stole, modified a protocol that Cornell uses for looking at forest, uh, deer impacts on seedlings, on oak seedlings and forests. Um, so what they do is they put seedlings out in different areas. Um, some of them are protected, some of them aren't. Um, and, and then they, they look at basically their survival over time. Um, so we do this with hostas. And so every May, um, they go out, they buy 40 or 50 sets of hostas, and they bring them to neighborhood houses. And then the neighbor, the people who have these things in their backyards, will keep an eye on them. And they will know when they're being browsed, and they will know when they disappear. And so we can do this little funny survival analysis on them. Um, so this is year one. And, right, those things, half of them were dead in, inside a week. Half of them had been completely demolished. Um, but over time, it got a little bit better. And so we'll see whether we have any, you know, any long-term effects. Um, there's certainly some anecdotes that people's hostas are surviving the whole summer, which they never used to do. Um, and so we've gone from 9% survival to 24% survival, which isn't great, but it means something is happening. Okay, and so, and again, it's good because the, this, the community is running this themselves. I basically gave them the protocol and they're, they're doing it all. And so, so that's a nice project. So with that in mind, um, we also have policy and regulatory challenges that I don't want to talk about. Um, but again, whether or not you have a hunt here, you need to, if, if it's a serious problem, if it's a real community problem, you need to address the challenges specifically and have impact measurements. You need to see whether what you're doing is working or not. And if it's not working, you do something else. Okay. Um, you, I noticed on your website that you, the police have assembled a nice list of all the um, your vehicle collisions over the last three years roughly, or two years, um, that's a great place to start. 
that needs to be summarized, and then you look to see whether whatever you're doing is reducing the deer vehicle collisions over time. Um, that, and that's obviously that's a super important one. Um, you've, again, you've also started doing some vegetation impact stuff, so you need to continue that and see if what you're doing is making things better or not. Um, and, um, and if not, try something else. Public education, your website is mixed. Um, again, the Lyme disease stuff is really good, um, but you're not getting a lot of like basic public education stuff out there about driving and about um, vegetation and protection and things like that. So use it. Um, you've got it. Um, I mostly look at our town's website to see if the garbage collection is picked up. But when I do that, there could be a banner in the front that would direct me to something useful. Um, so, and, and the, the last message here is if it's actually a problem, if it's a serious problem, you may have to spend some money to solve it. Um, or at least spend some, some town employee and volunteer time to, to solve it. Some of these things are pretty, pretty easy, can be done without a lot of work or spending a lot of money in terms of impact measurements, but actual actions in terms of you know, street modifications or, or anything else you might do to try to produce, to, um, to reduce deer impacts that are serious may take some resources. But again, if it's a serious problem, then you kind of need to do that. If it's not a serious problem, then, then don't come to meetings like this, honestly. Um, so, um, I'm still funded by the Humane Society of the United States. The person I work with most closely is a former student named Kaylee Pereira, um, who is now their director of operations for, um, for deer, deer contraception projects. She took that picture and that picture. Um, we work a lot with the Science and Conservation Center in Billings, Montana, which produces the PZP and trains people for using it. Um, my long-term colleagues, the late Jay Kirkpatrick, John Turner, Erwin Liu, uh, who I also worked with collectively on wild horse issues a lot. Um, other folks who worked with me on, on, at HSUS, um, Rick and Kayla. Um, and then every, every place we've ever worked, we've worked cooperatively with the community. Um, and so whether it was Fripp Island Property Owners Association or the, the Hastings on Hudson Village or um, the, the staff at the National Institute of Standards and Technology in cases where we've always done this with other people. So cooperation is really, really valuable. So, questions? Um, I have a question about maximum population. I don't understand why the deer population doesn't max out at a certain level when we've got 400 per square. I mean, it's crazy high. Numbers. It is incredible. And I don't. What happens, I think, is um, we at our, our Maryland site, when we first got there, the National Institute of Standards and Technology data, there were 300 deer on a square mile, some of which was paved. And, and everybody expected the populations to crash, and they never did. Um, and we brought them down maybe to 180 or 170. But um, what happens is they, have, they don't reproduce very fast anyway. Um, this is a, fawn survival is low, um, but these adult deer, they fill up on whatever there is, acorns especially, if they have a good acorn year, that'll get them through a year essentially. And so we can probably expect this year that you'll have really good adult deer survivor, survival because it's been a good acorn year. Um, I don't know. So these concerns about deer starving are not true. Well, because if they were starving, they would die, and the population would max out. So that's not true. Usually it's not true. So like 2015 in Massachusetts, we had a die off. Because what kills deer, what kills adult deer, are long, severe, snow-covered winters. Um, they're, they're, they can handle you know three months or four months of snow cover. But if, as it was that year, there was snow on the ground in April, and nothing is greening up, and there's no food for them. That's when they tend to. Um, that's when they tend to go. Um, and so that probably controls deer populations a little bit the farther, farther north you go. But down there, there's nothing. I mean, they just don't have winter there. 
So there's food available all year round. And of course, it's the suburbs and people are growing things and so there's always stuff for them. But it's really amazing. We were, we were shocked, but you know, they don't grow anymore because they can't, you know, the fawns don't survive, but the adults do. You showed the map of how many more denser deer are on the eastern side of Massachusetts. And short of having you come in to count our deer, how do we, find, how do we know how many deer Carlisle has? Um, counting deer is hard. Um, I think it may be getting easier um, in that people are developing, you know, aerial survey techniques with drones and other kinds of things that aren't as expensive as hiring an airplane or a helicopter to, you know, for $10,000 to fly over your town. Um, there's a lot of use of, um, of transects, um, which uh, with a technique called distance sampling, if it's done right, can be pretty accurate. Um, the question is, does it matter? how many deer you have? Or is it the impacts that you're worried about? I mean, it doesn't matter how many deer you have if you can reduce the number of deer vehicle collisions. Um, so the number is important if you're gonna manage them and you need to know what your targets are. You wanna manage the population. If, you know, if you've got 200 deer and you wanna, you know, and you wanna actually reduce the population with, with a call or with hunting, you can probably figure you need to take out you know, 50, 60 deer a year to start having any kind of impact. But, and so for that reason, you might want to know that you've got 200 deer. But otherwise, it's the impacts that matter. I'm impressed with the, the fact that you've researched some of Carlisle's rules and regulations and the police blotter oh, yeah. and things like that, so you come informed a little bit, or maybe a lot, about uh, Carlisle's particular situation. Uh, during the speech, you keep on saying, you know, if you really have a deer problem, if you really have a deer problem, meaning one does. The question is rather reduced. From what you've seen with the Carlisle research you've done, do you feel like Carlisle has a deer problem? Um, I haven't, what, I haven't looked at that piece of it, um, and it's not me to decide. It's the people who live here to decide whether it's a deer problem. You know, by, by Maryland standards, no, you don't have a deer problem. But, but you're not operating by Maryland standards. You know, uh, some people have compared the Carlisle situation with, with, I know this is very vague, you said Maryland, but with the Pennsylvania situation, is that, is that anything that, that is, uh, you want to comment on? Is Pennsylvania and Carlisle anything like so? Well, aside from the fact that Pennsylvania probably has four times as many deer per square mile as you do. Um, no, I mean, Pennsylvania is a difficult state to deal with. They, um, they have a terrific environment, including a lot of farms that produce a lot of food that deer are eating. So they have an agricultural food source for deer. Um, they've had very high deer densities in Pennsylvania for 80 or 100 years. Um, and part of that is that you know, it keeps their hunters happy. Um, they, have, they have way more hunters in Pennsylvania than here in Massachusetts. Um, and so it's it's just a pretty different system. So it sounds um, to me, since you said it's so local, um, if the problem were that the deer were damaging the understory and, we're, and we are worried about the understory in our public lands where we're actually walking, <laughs> would you say that the, the deer hunt in just those limited areas will help those areas. They won't help anything else. They won't help the people and their gardens. But do you think it might help the understories in those particular public lands? Not with those numbers. You have to do a lot better. Um, and I don't know if you can. Um, you might get lucky one year. Um, but again, given how difficult bow hunting is, um, and there's restrictions under which hunters are placed. Because I notice you've got big buffers around the hunting area. So there's plenty of unhunted land around that. And if you've got deer going back and forth from, you know, from the 
the, out, the periphery of the conservation land and then they're spending time in the village, then, um, then hunting in the middle may not help at all. So, or may not help much. So, probably not. Um, as I said, we really learn our deer really well so that we know where individual deer are, but that's a lot of work. That's so, not reasonable. Uh, just kind of a follow on. Um, if we put all our hunters in one of our uh, public places each year, and, and only one, and spread them all over, could we fix it in that pro in the, you think that would then maybe fix that area, and then we could move on to the next? If that were why we were doing yeah. the hunt. Um, I'm just, I'm, yeah, I'm yeah. Well, the, yeah, there's, there's a, yeah, there's a, a risk in terms of, yeah, I mean, if, if you put people in tree stands, I mean, and you really control it, you could do they that. They would know that they're rather, you know, they would know where right. everybody is. And so you might fix it for a year. Um, you're not going to get all the does, and so then two or three, if you don't hunt it the next year, then two or three years, they'll be back to where they were. I mean, they'll, they'll just breed. It's, it's, there won't be a lot of movement, most likely but they'll breed. And again, some of those deer are going to be spending time outside, and they're pretty smart in terms of knowing where the risks are. So. Are there other groups doing the, uh, the uh, bird control, or are you the only... Um... <sighs> We're, there, there's a community out in, near Cincinnati that's trying to do it. Um, it's kind of difficult, I mean, in the sense that the way we have to do it now, where we catch, we have to catch deer. So we need to tranquilize them, which means we need access to, to controlled substances, which means we have a vet tech who's on our team, which is, which is Kaylee. And, um, and it takes, it's hard. It takes a long time. Well, that's um, not an option. It's not yet. Not yet. I mean, our, our next, you know, we're now, now that we've solved a lot of the sort of vaccine-specific problems, we're trying to talk about what's trying to start scaling up in terms of making it available. And so there are regulatory issues at the state level, at the federal level, and training issues. And, and we're also trying to make it easy. Our, our current study, actually, um, our new study on Long Island in New York, um, we're looking at trying to figure out ways where we can identify deer without paying. If we could do that, it would be a lot easier. Is it true that um, deer herds tend to respond to culling by increasing their reproduction rates? I knew that question was coming. Um, <laughs> I, if they're well fed already, no. Right. I mean, if they're already already ha all having twins, then shooting a bunch of them isn't going to make any difference. They'll still have twins. I think. Um, that's compensatory reproduction, that's called. And it's definitely a thing, but like all things in ecology, it's complicated. Um, and so probably the more important point is that even without it, the deer populations through their natural reproduction will recover pretty fast. Um, where that might not be the case would have been someplace like our, our Maryland study site where we had 300 deer and they were all pretty hungry um, and they had low fawn survi survival. In that case, if you know somebody come in and shot them down to thirty, they would have started reproducing like crazy again. So, under those circumstances, maybe you would see that, but probably not for for the average, pretty well fed suburban deer. So, in a, in a sense, you're saying that the the situation where um, I mean, you're doing contraception on a, a research and study mm -hmm. basis, and it's arguably going to be very expensive the way you're doing it. Mm -hmm. Scale where it can be used by a lot of different communities, it would be done a little differently, I'm sure. But um, wouldn't you expect, uh, in a situation that's done on a larger scale, that you would still face the same problem where it would be difficult to get below a certain density because the people going out and uh, uh, darting the deer or whatever process is run into the same problem that the hunters run into, which is it's harder to find the deer because you're trying to take them around. And, they learn yeah. their own way, as you said. And right. when you look at the same sort of rule of thumb, how many hours per year can you spend by you eventually running into the same problem? Right. That's probably true. We have never been 
We have never worked anywhere long enough for, that we've run into that problem, but I will tell you that Kaylee was complaining to me last month that she, she was out there trying to find deer to dart, and she, she said, I'm not seeing any deer anymore. So, so you know, that's a good thing because she's not seeing any deer anymore, but, but definitely that, that effect would be there. So we don't know how well it can go. But there's a difference there because there's deer walking around that are infertile, as opposed to a deer that is killed um, can just be replaced by another deer that is fertile. So I, I think it's a little apples and oranges uh, because you're talking about that inefficiency curve, okay? After a certain, you know, with archery, correct? That's what you're referring to, right? The inefficiency well, whether curve. Whether it's archery or oh, whether, whether, whatever it is. And you're saying, is there an inefficiency curve uh, with contraception, right? Right. Uh, the, the, the thing is, there is a, a quote, uh, tar, you know, uh, cheating uh, vaccination uh, inefficiency curve, yes, but you also have a bunch of deer walking around who have already, who are already fertile. So it's, it's so it's, it's a, it's a I, different I, I, curve, but the problem is, I think the problem is the same. So even though they're infertile deer around, we're still looking for those last two two or three deer, deer that we haven't gotten. And so that's well, except take. deer are native in, in uh, North America. In other words, we're, we're not looking for zero deer. Oh, no, absolutely not. Right, 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 right. No. I like to. We can get down to a uh, very low population that may be approximating native deer population level. Yeah. Um, but you're I guess, talking I about guess suburban I, 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 Exactly. I'm talking about suburban conflicts. Okay. And, and you know, the ecological issues are kind of secondary for there. I mean, obviously, it's important in terms so of- So in Carlisle, there's a high percentage forest and landscape compared to other towns inside uh, 495. So the question is, in Carlisle, uh, with the heavy forest and landscape, it may not be the same suburban model. Yeah, it may, it may be a little different. Mm -hmm. I assume it probably is. Mm -hmm. Uh, we are currently having um, a hunt on some land that, um, according to Mass uh, Fish and Wildlife, shows very little deer impact. And the justification for that is that it's to prevent an increase of deer population on that land based on deer behavior. Is that reasonable to have a hunt where there's very little deer evidence? In terms of, if you think about it in terms of mitigating impact, um, it will probably be successful because even if they didn't do it, it would probably be successful. Okay, this is a pet peeve of mine. Um, and, and you did it too. Um, so the standard for towns that, um, that hold these kinds of hunts is at the end of the year, they say, we killed 15 deer, we killed 25 deer, nobody was hurt and there were no complaints, it was a success. And um, what would be not a success? Uh, if, if the criteria is that we killed some deer and didn't shoot anybody's dog, is that, you know, what is, that's basically a criterion for success for a recreational hunt. Sure, some, some guys spent some time in the woods and they had some fun and some of them got deer and they used the deer and, and there weren't any complaints, so great. But, but if the logic of doing this is that you want to do something about the understory, then you gotta measure effects on the understory. And that's the fact that you killed some deer is not a criterion for success. It's, and you kind of, people aren't good like population thinkers, it seems like. Um, and so what you want to think about is how do you reduce the population and reduce the impacts, not we killed some deer. Because they'll all, be, again, they'll all be replaced next year, and then some, so. Can you talk about introducing breeding predators? <laughs> I didn't. Um, I mean, just throwing it out there, that's what we're being recommended. Just to be clear. Yeah, somebody <laughs> recommended releasing tigers on Fire Island. Um, so, so, okay, so presumably you have lots of coyotes. Um, 
coyotes are not super effective deer predators. So you're talking about wolves and mountain lions. Um, it's not probably not great mountain lion country. Um, how do you feel about having wolves in town? <laughs> in this group, there are probably people. That, I mean, there are several issues. One is bringing wolves into town. The other is there's no guarantee that wolves would keep your deer population down. Right, so, so like coyotes and mountain lions and stuff, they're self-regulating, right? So they're territorial. Wolves that come into other wolves' territories get torn to shreds. And so we think about wolves. We live in this world where we think that because we killed predators, killed off the predators, that this is what allowed the explosion of of deer. But if you're feeding deer out there and they're producing two or three kids every year, wolves aren't going to keep up with them. Wolves may not even do the job. So, um, so it's kind of mixed. Suburban development, essentially. Yeah. yeah. And, and of course, nobody's going to take wolves here. So. <laughs> Understory is important. I'm sure it is. I just don't know why. And I just don't know. And then, so would there be anything that could be done in like a town? Probably in fences. Um, so I mean, understory is important because lots of stuff lives in the understory, right? So it's there are lots of kinds of plants, lots of kinds of birds, lots of kinds of little critters. So so in general, if we support biodiversity in principle, then it's good to have some understory. The other side of this thing is that, of course, Massachusetts forests are aging, right? And so the trees are getting older and bigger. And the older the forest, the less there is growing on the forest floor, which is part of the problem, which is that you know the densities of deer aren't be con being controlled by what's on the forest floor anymore. They're being controlled by what's outside the forest and in some place like this. And so I'm not sure how much understory we can expect in mature forest. We don't have a lot of it here, except the Harvard Forest. So there's, you know, in these real dense, you know, you go to a hemlock forest, it's all dark. There's nothing on the forest floor. Um, so, so again, this is an artifact of the history of, of the environment in Massachusetts, that most of our forests are, you know, 80 to 120 or 140 years old at this point. And, and once they get to that age, you know, they're not great deer habitat. And there's, they're not great deer habitat because not much is growing on the forest floor. But anyway, yeah. I have a question based on some of the stuff you were talking about. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned that we had been decreasing numbers for a little bit. Uh, we started having a more difficult time seeing or finding the deer mm -hmm. in Dartmoor. Would you say that is an indicator in itself that the deer are decreasing or that they just become more rare and going to hide. And the reason I ask the question is I've lived in town quite a while mm -hmm. and I would say we have half the number of deer now than we did 20 years ago. Really? Because I do the same type of behavior. I I go to the same areas. So I would expect to see the same number of deer or more. And I see less. So I'm curious to know whether this is more because the town is much more developed and deer are going in different areas, or whether the deer numbers are decreasing, as I believe they are, or what? I'm trying to understand some weighing in all the different comments that are presented in there. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I can't possibly speak to your particular experience. Um, for, for our Hastings study, there almost certainly are fewer deer. We also have like trail cameras up at night and stuff like that, and so, so we're seeing fewer deer. Um, but they may be behaving differently too. I mean, and that's again, that's what we saw at, at Fripp. It's clearly they are not out in the daytime anymore. Um, and so, so I have no idea how to answer that question. 
Right, that's the point. That's why suburbs are so good, and that's why they're more dear. Is right. We carve, we you know, take these blocks of forest, we cut pieces out of them, we create all this edge, plus we plant stuff in the areas where we where we're building, and and they like that stuff. Yeah. So it may well be, but but again, you may not be looking the same place as well, he is. Right. <laughs> yeah, that may be. That may be. Yeah. So again, yeah. I mean, in in if you stay in the forest, you won't see many deer. Um, lots of questions. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you've been clear that the logistics of implementing an you know, contraception program in a, in a town with relatively low numbers compared to the Fire Island and other studies is, is daunting. But do you think there could be a synergy if the town is willing to um, put out some money to get uh, synergy with a professional hunter who could you know, bait and, and dart, tranquilize the animals? And, yeah, and some, so we hope to get there. We hope to get there at some point. Be more, yeah. You know, yeah. We're, we're not there yet, but, um, but that's where we hope to go. Well, to, to add on that, can you tell about any experience you've had with uh, Mass Wildlife about neutering them like this? Um, I have never approached them, and they have never approached me. Um, I don't think that they feel that this is a suitable solution for any place. Well, they. <laughs> no. um, there, there hasn't been any interest from that. So, so there probably hasn't been any of these type of uh, programs in Massachusetts, though, because you need their permission. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, many years ago, that city of Newton had a captive deer herd. Um, yes, they had a captive deer herd that we basically treated to extinction. Um, and Mass Wildlife knew about it, but didn't permit it, basically. Um, but it was a very weird situation. Um, they were beloved of the town, and nobody wanted to shoot them, but they were you know, they were on just a few acres and they were just destroying the place. So Newton wanted to get rid of them, but didn't want to kill them. So we did that. But that's the only thing we've ever done in Massachusetts. So I understand that it can't be done right now because of various regulations and you don't have the time to do it. But I'm curious, if it was possible, can you give us some estimate as to the cost that it would be? Like cost per deer or cost per town or something? Like yeah. We have about 15 square miles here in town, so it's right. Really Probably you wouldn't be doing the whole town. Um, I mean, all the work that we've done so far has been research, and so there are all kinds of added costs to it. If you, if we have to capture deer, um, that adds a significant cost. But we're talking in the hundreds, you know, per deer. For sure, per deer, per, deer. Um, per treatment. Um, but beyond that, I'm not. I'm not going to guess. If you don't have to capture them, it could be cheaper. And then, um, S22, the PZP twenty two. Yes. Um. We need to hit them in the butt, and we, you usually need to hit them like sideways. Right. So we haven't done it from tree stands. We sort of do it from from flats. Yeah, take flat shots. Um, yeah. 
Oh, yes. And fishers have a lot of fish in the fishing population. Yeah. 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 Coyotes definitely take fawns. Yeah. And bobcats surely take them hmm. as well. Uh, Jerry talked about being here for 40 years, and over that period of time, we've had hunting uh, over the uh, mm -hmm. And so this last year has represented another sort of layer of that activity. Mm -hmm. In a different part of, of town, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it was uh, fairly significant in terms of from the baseline of fifteen or twenty a year that we've had over the last thirty or forty years, we've gone to thirty or forty a year in one year. Um, but but the problem is anecdotal. It's it's all anecdotal except for what the police have. Uh, Collected in the water, which is mm -hmm. something like two incidents a month, and not always near deaths, but they're incidents a year a, a month. And, uh, in, and, and so that's a, been a constant. Um, what's, what's the best way of, short of all of this anecdotal kind of sense that we have a problem because our classes are gone? Uh, and, <laughs> and what, what's, what's the best way of establishing a baseline that would be credible? Um, you can, me again, measure the impacts. There's um, some interesting work being done um, to develop fairly simple ways to measure um, deer browse impacts on mm -hmm. understory, um, which sort of comes out of New York, and, uh, but there's been some cooperation from UMass and stuff. Um, it might be worth you know, setting up a school program or something like that where every year they go out and they you know, count the number of, of twigs that have been browsed, and you can at least look at look at trends that way. I mean, your baseline is now, kind of by definition. Is there any correlation start. with invasive species problem in this problem? Uh, that I mean, I know that has been that has been raised um, as as a possible issue. Um, I don't know how good the evidence actually is for that, but it's it's certainly possible. Um, you know, deer don't eat barberry. So there are places that are full of barberry where there are a lot of deer. Um, in Maryland, we have. <laughs> yeah, they like greenbrier, which is a native, but, um, and yeah, all kinds of stuff. Um, I don't know how, my guess is that's probably a complicated question. <laughs> So you started talking about how this whole thing about deer has something to do with how we as humans interact with animals and it's sort of like on a kind of meta level. And, and if I could just go back to that, I've been wondering as towns are popping up in this sort of, you know, outside of Boston, inside of uh, Boston, is this really something else? I mean, I, I suspect that it is something beyond the browsing of the certain twigs in the forest, and that there are sort of other forces that are kind of motivating or generating or somehow conflating this issue of why hunting is popping up in all these towns. And I'm just wondering if you have thoughts about that, because you did say it has something to do with how we think about humans' interactions with nature. Um, <laughs> I mean, I think there's a, there's certainly an interest on the part of the state in opening up more land out here to hunting. Um, you know, that's in their legislative mandate. That's you know where they get their funding from. So they're certainly pushing it. Um, I I think there's that that pe there are a lot there are many people who like their nature somewhere else rather than in their backyards. And, and deer are big and they, are, they, are, they don't belong in people's yards. And a lot of people have that kind of, you know, it's fine if, it's fine if they're in the conservation areas. I want to see a few deer in the conservation areas, but I don't want them in my yard. So I think there's, that's driving some of it. Um, 
And, and you know, hunting opportunities are pretty limited. Um, as, as one of my hunter friends has said, you know, when he was a kid, he would hunt down the street. He could, you know, leave his, his house and walk down to the end of the road and go into the woods and, and hunt. And there's not a lot of that anymore, certainly not in the eastern half of the state, because somebody owns everything and and there's no trespassing and there's, you know, you have to get to know people and it's not convenient and and so you end up going to wildlife management areas out in you know central mass or western mass somewhere. And so um, I think that's part of you know mass wildlife's interest. I think that's part of the hunting community's interest is to have hunting in you know in inconvenient areas. If conservation areas are going to continually age and heavily forested areas that are very tall, and anything that's less than eight feet is going to be eaten, but there's nothing less than eight feet anymore because the trees are so tall and they're shading anything. Is it really possible to take a conservation area and say, okay, it's being effective or not effective when your nature itself is creating an ancient forest? Yeah, it's, it's hard. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's unless, again, unless you build a fence around it, you really can't discriminate. But you, Probably but you can't anyway because the shading is going to kill the understory, isn't it? Yeah. For the most part, I mean, they'll you know, in some forests there'll be some in forests that are deciduous where there's there's light, you know, at the beginning of the year there would normally be some flowers and things coming out before everything pours over, um, but uh, in others that are like really dense, there won't be much. Is it fair, is it fair to say that there are a lot of areas affecting the forest? Oh yeah. Right now? yeah, 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 yeah. And just assuming that you know. Yeah, the other, I mean, again, the other issue is the practical one, whereas where, and this is a, something else a colleague of mine said, if, if there's not much light coming down there, two or three deer could vacuum up everything that's in the forest. And so, um, so it gets, you know, it gets harder unless you want to manage the forest for deer and chop down trees and you know make spaces for things to grow. Yeah. Just a quick comment about uh, oh, what you were saying. Uh, so a, a true sort of old growth forest is actually mixed age, okay, and then also has uh, openings because large tree a large tree falls over in old growth creates quite a big opening. So in Carlisle we're looking at uh, kind of late successional forests, so uh, not so much mixed age forests. So I think it's just important yeah. to distinguish between what well, people use the term old growth or old forest versus some level of successional forest, which is where Carlisle's at. We have a couple pockets. We have some isolated, very old trees, but generally speaking, it's all overgrown pasture. Uh, so, right. so it's, a, mm -hmm. it's kind of a monoculture. It's not so right. much mixed age. Right, because we abandon all the land at the same time, basically, and yeah. all the trees start growing at the same time. Um, you hear people say that um Pretty commonly, because I mean, Lyme disease is obviously a pretty serious problem, um, especially in this part of the country. Um, again, the problem is that the relationship between deer densities and Lyme disease transmission is really complicated. And so there are probably a dozen studies looking at the relationship between deer densities and Lyme disease transmission, or the density of infectious ticks, which is sort of the surrogate variable. Um, some, some of them say <laughs> that, it, that it helps to reduce deer population. Some of them say that it, that it doesn't help. Um, the sort of general overall trend seems to be that above 20 deer per square mile, it doesn't matter how many deer you have. Once you get down to five deer per square mile, it might have an impact in terms of reducing the density of 
in fact, is text. But it's, it's probably not a super, it's not a direct way to reduce Lyme disease at all. <laughs> How effective is Blue Hills? Well, they benefited from 2015. So that they, they started their hunt, I think, in 2013 and, and took some deer out. And then we had all, all that snow and all those deer died from starvation. And so that probably helped them. Um, I, I'm not clear. Um, they've changed their deer density estimation methods. Um, it maybe looks like they have fewer deer, but it's hard to know. Um, they've concentrated in, in certain con concentrated hunting in certain places, but I'm I'm not sure. I don't think they've done the, like vegetation impact analysis yet. Uh, yeah. Blue Hills Reservation is surrounded by lush suburban landscape. It totally is. It's just ridiculous. So they can just keep killing deer in the Blue Hills Reservation. <laughs> Running out of the mountains in camp in Sterling and just chewing up all that nice suburban land. So. Yeah, that's. I mean, it's big enough that there may be some deer that that don't get out of the yeah. park. But yeah. but but yes, that's right. A lot of the park is close to places where the deer are definitely coming out. So it's going to be challenging. Oh, come on. I don't want to call up any good questions. So it sounds like the only decent way to try to protect our forests is to fence them in. Is that correct? Well, fence pieces, <laughs> fence pieces of them, I think, is because fencing is super expensive. And obviously, one of our, one of our folks in, in um, Hastings, now that we've got the deer population down, has this idea that he wants to fence that whole 100 acres and kick all the deer out. And aside from the fact that every homeowner in Hastings is going to have like five more deer in his backyard. Um, <laughs> there will be collisions. I, I'm not a huge fan of fencing, but but it might be worthwhile if there are particular patches that you want to defend. It might be might be worth doing. Cost money. Um, I mean, certainly, it's 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 not hard to build fences that other things can go through, um, but but then you have to maintain them because you know you get windstorms and trees come down and land on them and open them up, and that's actually what happened with the enclosures in Hastings that the high school kids were putting up. They they got wrecked by palm trees and stuff. So it's it's not simple, but you'd have to be right well, there. Um, I thought about that a little bit. Massachusetts is being really careful of trying to keep keep it out of the state. Um, the Chronic wasting disease in wild deer is very closely associated with chronic wasting bees in captive deer. So most of the outbreaks that we've seen around the country start with the deer trade, with privately owned deer. And when you start moving animals around like that, then it potentially escapes. Um, I don't think it's a population level threat to deer because, you know, in heavily hunted deer populations, right, they're all being shot by the time they're two anyway, and they're doing fine. And so chronic wasting disease does not, it is slow to progress. And so the deer will reproduce just fine before they get it. But on the other hand, um, you know, then it poses other kinds of potential risks, uh, certainly to hunters, and, but to anybody who handles them. So it wouldn't be a good thing. But it's probably not a threat to deer. It's probably a threat to us. All right, well, thank you.